the final storyteller has a very difficult last name to pronounce. Um, when I asked him uh, who's right, uh, he said uh, left. And his name is <laughs> Leonard Mladenov. Please welcome Leonard Mladenov, everyone. I was on my first book tour. I was uh, in a TV studio in Los Angeles, and I was going to do my first television interview. Uh, not for here, it was going to be broadcast in India, but still, it was my first television interview, and I was very nervous. But I had a way of dealing with that. I had a, a couple of defenses, and my first defense was, you know, they can always edit it out if I say something really dumb. So I'm thinking, you know, um, I mean, I know now that it's not quite like that. Uh, if they say something really dumb, that is the interviewer, they might edit it out, they might not. If I say something really dumb, they're going to go, yeah, let's put that on, you know? But um, back then, I was a little bit naive, and so I talked to the technician, and I said, if I say something, you know, that's really dumb, uh, can I just, you know, mention it later and make sure you guys don't, you know, don't air that? He says, what are you talking about? This is live. So, you know, having been nervous to start with, of course, this made things even worse. But being resourceful, I had my second line of defenses, okay? My second line of defenses was, the book was a book on non-Euclidean geometry, okay? How many people are going to really watch a show on that? I mean, I'm going to say things maybe like, uh, you cannot embed a um, surface of negative curvature axisymmetrically in flat space. And I'm figuring this is going to be a few bearded intellectuals or some college stations or something. I mean, it's not going to be a very popular show. And so I asked the technician, you know, what kind of show is this? How many people do you think are going to watch the show? And he says, oh, it's one of the most popular shows in India, about 300 million. <laughs> 300, I mean, yes, that, that was really terrifying. And uh, I couldn't figure out why 300 million people in India would want to watch a show on non-Euclidean geometry. As apparently, I thought I'd be on some marginal show, and I'm on the Oprah Winfrey of India. And um, so I say, you know, the book is called Euclid's Window, but it's not about voyeurism. It's about geometry. But he just said, look at the monitor, and the, the, um, your interviewer's face will come on there and try to talk to the screen. Well. I was used to being embarrassed, actually, um, because as a child, I was often embarrassed. Um, I was embarrassed by my home. Um, I was embarrassed because I was different, uh, and I didn't really fit in. My parents were um, unassimilated Polish Jews. Now, if you're in New York, if you're in Brooklyn, which is where my parents met, if you're in Israel, or even in Skokie, a few towns over from my home of Evanston, Illinois, uh, then there's a lot of unassimilated Polish Jews and everything's fine. But in my town, there were just a smattering of Jews, and there were uh, no other immigrants, immigrant Jews that I knew of. But at my home, of course, everyone who ever came over was another immigrant Jew. I don't remember my parents ever having an American um, friend. And so things were a little bit different for me. Uh, for instance, in, in, um, in kindergarten, I had to have speech therapy because I spoke English with a Polish accent. And I didn't speak Polish, I just spoke English with a Polish accent. <laughs> You know, what I ate was strange. I mean, one of my few visits to a friend's house, I remember the mother offering me, um, asked if I wanted a grilled cheese sandwich, and I said, what's that? Now, the name is fairly descriptive, <laughs> but, you know, to, to me, the whole concept of grilled sandwich cheese, I mean, it, you know, it just didn't seem to fit together, and it ended up just being this embarrassing thing where I'm, you know, and, and that happened to me a lot. The clothes that I wore, was all, were also very strange. They had plaid pants and, I don't know, all these weird things from Poland, I guess. And, and when they wore out, instead of tossing them, uh, my parents would patch them. And, you know, they said, the pants are still good. Why throw them out? But, you know, the food is still good. Let's have leftovers. I don't care how tasteless and unappealing it was to begin with. We're going to finish it. And usually that happens uh, in, in America. They say, well, because kids are starving in India. 
Uh, but for me, it was, it was different. Um, it was because my parents themselves had been starving just a few years earlier um, in the concentration camps. And so they had a very personal connection with what it meant to conserve resources. <clears throat> and so um, when my father, for instance, was um, liberated, he, he weighed uh, 85 pounds. The man that I knew was about 160 pounds. And around my house, I was used to seeing um, my friend's parents. They had tattoos on their arms from the camps. I didn't have relatives like all the other kids that I knew. Uh, I didn't have, except with one exception, uh, aunts, uncles, cousins, uh, uh, grandfathers, grandmothers. And so my, my upbringing was really very different. <clears throat> but I didn't really know the details because um, my parents didn't like to talk about it until one day after a Passover Seder. And we were walking after dinner, as my, we often did. And my father started telling me about some of his experiences. Uh, he told me of a time when he was um, in Buchenwald and he had stolen a loaf of bread. Well, the baker had figured out that a loaf of bread was missing. I guess the Germans were always very good record keepers. And um, he lined up everyone that had access to the bread. And he asked, he had the Gestapo there, and he asked, uh, who stole the loaf of bread? Please step forward. Well, he probably didn't say please. <clears throat> and my father did not step forward. So then the baker turned to the Gestapo and said, uh, start at this end, and sh everyone, until they're either all dead or the thief steps forward. So at this point, my father did step forward because he thought that he would be killed either way. And I learned about the randomness in concentration camps and about the people playing God. Um, but instead of killing my father when he stepped forward, the baker gave him a plum job as his assistant in the bakery. <clears throat> my father also told me about before he got sent to the camps when he was um, in, the, in the ghetto in his town of Częstochowa which was a ghetto, it was an area that was cordoned off where the Jews were waiting to be deported, basically. And um, he was in the Jewish underground, and I later learned he was a, uh, one of the leaders in the underground in his town. And what he told me was were amazing things that you would think about only happen in films and don't really happen in, in real life. Um, for instance, uh, they would go and sabotage railroads. They would sneak out and sabotage railroads. Um, they would have trials if they suspected someone of being a traitor. And if they concluded that the person probably was a traitor, then they would execute them on the spot. And I asked my father how that felt, not knowing for sure whether this person was a traitor. And he told me just that we did what we had to do. Um, he told me about um, smuggling babies, little babies in backpacks out of the ghetto and giving them to Polish families to raise. And I actually later once met one that was a uh, scientist at the University of Chicago. So all this stuff really blew me away because I had known my father as a middle-aged, balding, semi-pot-bellied, chain-smoking, five-foot-six Jewish guy. And, and now I found out he was Arnold Schwarzenegger or like he had just ripped off his suit and there's a big S on his chest and it was really um, amazing to me. Um, but then he dropped the real bombshell he told me that he had had another family before the war. He had a wife and two babies, and they were killed by the Germans. So that the family that I knew, myself and my uh, three brothers and my mother, um, were really written over on parchment where his previous family had been, from where his previous family had been erased. Well, he would only talk about these stories for a little while. I mean, it lasted a couple of years, and then he didn't want to talk about it any longer. And I went off and did my thing. I went off to college, and I uh, studied physics. I actually 
majored in chemistry, physics, and math for most of my career there. And I've always was, I was consciously aware that when I was in college, I was looking for my own heroism. Now I lived, you know, in, in here having a pretty soft life. So my heroism wasn't the kind of heroism that he displayed, but it was intellectual heroism. I always sought the hardest problem, the, the most difficult task. Uh, and, I, and I knew that I felt like I was at war. I was at war with ignorance when I was at college. I wanted to learn as much as possible and to accomplish as much as possible. And I finished college. I got a PhD in physics. I uh, got a job at Caltech. And uh, then I went on to do other things, uh, other intellectual dragons to slay. I broke into Hollywood and wrote for Star Trek and some other shows, and I did some other things. <clears throat> And then eventually I got back to uh, doing some research in physics and teaching and writing books. And that brings me back to the uh, story at the beginning, which is I'm staring at this uh, TV screen waiting for the moderator. I guess this technician was counting down four, three, two, one, to start asking me questions. And I realized something that I've realized and used, uh, and I, uh, a thought that I've um, uses a crutch many times since then, tonight for instance, when I'm standing in front of all of you, although I can't see one of you, so it's not so hard. Um, which was, um, I realized that nothing bad could really happen to me. I mean, if the moderator said to me, hey, not that this Oprah Winfrey of India would say this, but hey, what do you think of Euclid's fifth postulate? Or what does that say about Euclid? I could, I could turn around, pull down my pants, moon the camera, and go, ooga booga, ooga booga, and nothing really bad would happen to me. I mean, they, they, they would not take my mother and gas her. They wouldn't shoot my babies. And nobody that I loved would have any tragedy befall them. And because of my history, I knew that that was all that really mattered. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.